30. Readministering land in the Bahamas. Look up in the Bahamas. The Bahamas Land Use Policy and Administration Project was the larger issue. It was organized in a similar way to the LUPAP in Trinidad and Tobago, but this time I was simply one member of a very large team. The Bahamas had lots of issues arising from the vastly different sources of tension regarding land. These included attracting investments in tourism establishments, wealthy foreigners wishing to establish residency, squatting and resettlement of illegal immigrants, Haitians, managing a fast-growing land sales market, distinguishing individual claims in generational land, vesting title in common ages land, maintaining environmental integrity, and managing of a peacetime marine and coastal zone. Believe me when I tell you that there were no shortages of real estate issues in this paradise for North American vacations. One of the big issues was the desire of the Bahamian Authority to migrate their registry from one of land deeds to land title. Unless you are a real estate agent, you will not fully appreciate the difference between these two systems of registering ownership of a parcel of land. Not even the lawyers seem to understand this and the non-experienced ones simply used a checklist system to ensure that they had covered all bases with adequate documentation. The Lupap team held several town meetings in such places like Grand Town, New Providence, Georgetown, Exuma, Rock Sound, Elutra, and Fox Hill. Based on the comments coming from members of these communities, it was clear that a lot of explaining was needed regarding the status of land titles and the documentary evidence required for ownership. Far from being a simple matter, migrating the registration of deeds to a system of title registration was not going to be an easy task. For starters, you had the issue of cleaning the title to make sure that it had sound roots going back at least 30 years. In the old English system, you can ask the question, who owned this land before you and before them? When you start asking such a question in the Bahamas, it doesn't take long before you are faced with other legitimate but not legal forms of ownership. Recognizing non-legal land occupation. The serious forms of non-legal tenure in the Bahamas were common edges and generational lands. Assignment was to come up with methods to deal with these non-legal titles as part of the total effort to reconstruct land administration in the Bahamas. Experimenting with legal solutions to this problem was not new in the Bahamas. In 1959, the government of the Bahamas attempted to do a quick clean of land ownership claims by legislating a Quieting of Titles Act. This act allowed a person to publicly declare his claim to a parcel of land and wait for a period of time to allow anyone with a contrary claim to come forward for a resolution. If no alternative claims were received by the court within the specified time, the court was free to proceed and decide in the favor of the petitioner as being the rightful owner. Quieting Act sounded fair and just, and it did provide a mechanism for cleaning titles. Its implementation was not inclusive enough. In many cases, individuals in the community 
who might have been affected by this procedure were totally unaware that the land they occupied was already in contention. The primary promoters of this statute were the real estate developers who needed a quick mechanism for settling claims, borrowing all rights and interests, and providing a marketable title. At a Fox Hill Tongue meeting held on December the 6th, 206, there was an allegation that the Catholic Church had quieted title to land that had never been in its possession. Now you have to understand that the Bahamas is predominantly Anglican, so such talk must be taken with a grain of salt. Participants also complained that certain persons had been able to use the Quieting Act to acquire property that they had never ever possessed. Spotters, who had occupied land for as little as six months, joined in the fray of taking advantage of the act. On a whole, in the public's eye, this was a very bad solution. Documentation on hominages. Surprisingly, we did find some documented evidence of claims of commonage land in the historical records of the Lands and Surveys Department. There were mostly cases on the islands of Eleuthera and Exuma. This legal documentation supported such claims as follows. Eleuthera, Savannah Sound. A grant in 1792 was made to the people of Savannah Sound in recognition of their help in driving the Spaniards from Nassau. The Crown accepts the fact that the community had established long possession on it against the Crown. Eleuthera Harbour Island In 1842, a grant of 6,000 acres was issued to about 320 grantees, male and female. Exuma Rural Town a private grant was made from the owner of the estate, Mr. Rowe, in perpetuity to his slaves and descendants for their use. These lands were left to the slaves by Lord Rowe forevermore and may be considered as generation property rather than as commonage. In Victoria, made a royal grant in 1844 the forty-four men from Harbour Island who used trickery to drive the Spaniards out of Nassau. A copy of the original grant is in the Registry of Records, Volume 1.4 at page 509. The problem here was that we had no statute on the books to give these claims a legal footing. The Communage Act, 30 April 1896, gave us an unworkable definition of communages, which such statements as any lands which had been granted to more than 20 persons and not partitioned. The long title of the Act was an Act to provide for the more beneficial use of lands held in common. As such, it emphasized what class of lands was subject to the benefits of this act, but it did not deny any other self-defined commonage. Furthermore, there was no basis to limit the word granted in the act to mean only crown grants, given the historical precedent of slave owner grants in Exuma and Eleuthera. We really couldn't work with this. As David Santry had observed, respected legal minds have not found a basis in formal law for commonages other than the Commonages Act, but they recognize that commoners, through custom and long possession, do have unspecified rights to lands they recognize as commonages. Written 
with land legacy in the Caribbean. In my report, I suggested three options, ranging from benign neglect to the progressive acculturation of indigenous landholding patterns. If there was no crown grant to the common age as common property, then simply declare the land to be crown land and regularize its occupation. An alternative would be for the government to accept the existence of a crown grant and then devise an arrangement with the commoners for government to reacquire the land and then regularize occupation using standard passages. Alternatively, the Crown could consider simply reasserting its ownership of the land and regularize it using normal passages. Dealing with a situation like this, it is always wise to keep looking towards the persons involved for the solution. Strengthening the governance capacities of the common edges would make them viable where common properties have some history of community management. This would have the advantage of identifying the land, the human resources, and the rights to the land prior to making any final decision about the ultimate fate of the common edge. The big question was where do we start? One first steps would be to survey the boundaries of the common edge so as to identify any encroachments that may have occurred. Another first step would be to gather information about each common age so as to establish how well they had been functioning in recent years. A third would be to dramatically modify the legal structure of the common ages, upgrade the organization capacities, and explore new legal models. All of these are costly items and who will pay for it? David Stanfield came up with a less costly idea of using the condominium law to legally create individual parcels for residential and commercial purposes. While these would be privately owned by commoners, the common areas would be held as undivided shares by all the unit owners. Commoners could presumably establish a cooperative society under the Cooperative Society Act of 1974 Chapter 315 as a vehicle for holding and managing common age land. Here again, I could think about using some forms of enterprise revenue generating joint ventures between common age and management firms such as the proposed marina in the Stephenton Commonage in Exuma. Such joint ventures would not involve the alienation of commonage land, but would require new capacities in the commonage management for negotiating and monitoring any contracts which were devised. Generation Lands More complex situation, however, lay in the tenure known as Generation Land. In other Caribbean territories, this legacy was known as Family Land, Children's Property, and Succession Ground. Generation Land is a spatial dimension of a family line, mirroring its identity and continuity. It provides freehold usufructus rights, which may be expressed as house size, a spot for a kitchen garden, food trees from which to pick foods, and a place to visit or return, especially in times of need. This tenure system also had no documentary precedent. The major challenge in our time was to sort out who had what rights to what pieces of such land, and to find legal ways to invest title in specific people for specific parcels. You remember your childhood jigsaw puzzle consisting of small irregularly cut pieces that were to be fitted together to form a picture? That is the best description I can give 
of the Generation Land situation in the Bahamas. The documentary evidence that persons were using to claim land was really evidence of family lineages and inheritance, but not of the land. However, administrators of land could not themselves dismiss such rights. Only a judicial decision or a legislative decision can extinguish these rights. But be aware, a court cannot extinguish a right that it has not at first recognized. to argue customary rights. As you can imagine, this controversy can become complicated very fast. There's a preface in Roman law that goes like this. Cessante ratione legis, cessat lex ipsa. Which in Latin means, when the reason for a law cease, the law itself cease. That was always the easy argument against customary rights, lurking over the horizon, waiting to be used as political leverage. One of the pleasures of pursuing English land law as established in the precedence of common law is that it gives you a unique window into the history of their thinking. It consists the concept of a custom. In order to be binding, a custom must derive its status from the fact that, by long uses, it had obtained the force of law. All you had to do was to prove that the uses had been in practice for a long period, and with such invariability as to establish itself as a governing rule in a particular locality. What is the force behind this rule? None, actually. There is another old English adage in common law, which reads, Nec vi, nec clam, nec precario. I already told you of my obsession with Latin. This one in Latin translates as, without force, without secrecy, without permission. Lord Hoffman, offered an alternative formulation that read, not by force, nor stealth, nor the license of the owner. This was the principle by which customary rights may be built up over time, principally in public rights of way in the United Kingdom. Thus, if enough of us made a path to someone's property to get to the beach, openly, not against protest, but still without permission of the landowner, and for an extended period of 20 years, then a permanent legal right to such a use has been established. Vijay Krishna, a prominent Indian jurist, had written a lot on justification for the acceptance of customary law as part of a knowledge system. Our class of generation lands in the Bahamas, however, lacked one major ingredient which could have given it more clout as a legitimate claim. Its occurrence had no spatial dimension that reflected any degree of social cohesion over time. It had families but it did not have communities. Writing about customary law in India, Vijay Krishna tried to base his justification as coming out of nature. Starting his essay with a quote from Cicero, the Roman senator whose name gave us the term Ciceronian to the English language, which by the way means eloquent, he was quoted as follows, Justice has emanated from nature. Therefore, certain matters have passed into custom by reason of their utility. Finally, the fear of law, even religion, gives sanction to those rules which have both emanated from nature and have been approved by custom. 
AJ was claiming was that a cumulative body of knowledge and beliefs emanating from nature and being handed down through generations by cultural transmission with each other and with our natural environment is also indigenous knowledge. Such knowledge is reinforced by the customary actions of persons. So if we know that our family have always lived on this parcel of land, it becomes our family land by custom. Having no standing in the legal profession, I myself argued instead for generation land trusts to be given the legal status. Generation land trusts would become non-for-profit family controlled organizations that would own, develop, and or manage local assets, building land houses for the benefit of the family. They are neighborhood based and could have a range of possible uses depending on what the local community wants. The principle behind Generation Land Trust would be to use assets in location to the benefit of all the legal heirs to it. In other words, the family can use the physical assets already recognized as theirs to create wealth that is available for distribution among family members, keeping the land within the family and leaving everyone better off. In such a case, the legal structure of the family land can be entered into a deal with a hotel resort developer in which they, the family members, will have shares in the development coming from the contribution of the use of their land or portions thereof. Strong pushback. You may ask, what happened to all these wonderful ideas? Most of the land administration recommendations did find their way into proposals for development funding depending on the priorities of the government. However, we got stiff resistance from other members of the team. Let me just share with you part of an email that David Stanfield had received from two members of the LUPAP team whose assignment had to do with technology and other structural matters exchange of communications with David Stanfield. David writes, I will also clarify such terms as fixed, customary, tenure, etc. By the way, what term would be acceptable to describe the colonial masters? I looked at several options and did not find anything less pejorative. Comment inserted by Peter. I think the removal of the term completely is what is desired. None of us were clear on the relevance of the framework to the Bahamas and how it was being used as a reference or underpinning. It looked as if it had simply been dropped in and the reader was somehow to make sense of it. David. But I cannot insert discussions of African customary tenure of common property regimes in other countries, given the time constraints. I am glad that Peter and Tex are interested in these topics, and I can give them some references. I suggest that a good start would be Jean Besson's chapter in the book that emerged from the Port of Spain conference, Land in the Caribbean. Comment inserted by Peter. Not fair here. You are the one who references the slaves coming out of the plantation adopting customary African tenure. This is quite a striking statement. If you do not have the time to develop this, then I would recommend its removal completely. As Besson does not analyze or describe the Bahamian condition, I am not sure the reference has any relevance. One of these gentlemen was a Bahamian businessman and the other was from the USBI. Part of their objection 
may have originated from the fact that they had both developed among them land system companies offering services to help private investors overcome land tenure problems. Their only perspective on land issues was from the point of view of real estate. To them, you defeat your purpose if you try to analyze land matters in a way that prejudices its value as a tradable commodity.